The Ear to Asia podcast is made available on the Jakarta Post platform under agreement between the Jakarta Post and the University of Melbourne. Hello, I'm Peter Clark. This is Ear to Asia. While many people argue that neutrality is necessary for good humanitarian action, in reality, in a country like Myanmar, where you have a military that doesn't respect international humanitarian law, that violates humanitarian access, how can you maintain neutrality? Local actors in Myanmar argue that neutrality just doesn't make sense and doesn't work and can instead do more harm than good. I think the Myanmar story tells us that the world's changing. Local aid organisations need to have just a much stronger say in the shape of programs and the way that things are designed. And there's this push against the old ways of big international agencies kind of running their own show and making their own decisions. That's going to come to an end. In this episode, Aid Under Fire... The Dilemmas Facing Humanitarian Actors in Strife-Torn Myanmar. Ear to Asia is the podcast from Asia Institute, the Asia Research Specialist at the University of Melbourne. Myanmar is a country in crisis. A military coup in February 2021 toppled the elected government of Aung San Suu Kyi triggering a massive popular uprising that has been met with a brutal junta-led crackdown on protesters and the civil disobedience movement. Thousands of civilians have been killed, thousands more detained and tortured, and severe restrictions have been imposed on internet access, media freedom and civil liberties. All this on top of an existing situation in Myanmar in which millions of people were already suffering from poverty, conflict displacement and natural disasters. Delivery of aid by international and local organisations has also been impeded by the junta, with aid workers facing increasing challenges and risks in accessing and assisting people in need. As international players pull back, local civil society organisations have stepped up to serve beleaguered communities. Yet local aid actors are now calling for rapid and significant reforms as they're finding long-established operational practices and funding models are simply ineffective in today's environment. So how are aid organisations, local and international, navigating the ethical and practical dilemmas of humanitarian efforts in Myanmar? How viable are alternative models and approaches that are emerging from local aid workers on the ground? And how applicable might these alternatives be in other theatres of operation? With me to examine the practice and peril of delivering humanitarian aid in Myanmar and what it says about the larger aid industry are Development Studies researchers and Myanmar watchers, Dr Anne Dacobert and Dr Tamus Wells, both from the University of Melbourne. Anne and Tamus, welcome back to Ear to Asia. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Tamas, we need a bit of context, don't we? We've got a lot to discuss about Myanmar, but let's just wind the tape back a bit. That military coup I mentioned that took place on February the 1st, 2021, was a watershed event for the humanitarian aid landscape, that goes without saying, in Myanmar, and it changed how humanitarian aid is being delivered in Myanmar. So let's go back. Myanmar has been receiving humanitarian aid for several decades, hasn't it? Give us the underlying reasons for that prolonged aid. Yeah, uh, I mean, over the last century, Myanmar or or Burma, as it was known, has had an extremely depressing political trajectory. And, you know, if we go back to after British colonialism, they've had some of the longest running civil wars in the world, half a century of a really brutal military dictatorship. It's a really resource rich country with, you know, oil deposits and timber and precious stones and all kinds of economic opportunities. But because of those military governments, the, the economy has stagnated over that time. And it's one of the poorest countries in Asia. And it's, yeah, it's really striking if you think back a century with Myanmar and compare it to a country like Singapore now. So a century ago, Myanmar would have been the far more promising part of the British colonies than Singapore. But now, obviously, Singapore is one of the richest countries in the world, and Myanmar has stagnated for a lot of that time. So because of all these different factors, economic, political, you know, conflict, there's been just a desperate need for humanitarian aid over the last few decades. 
but clearly that's extremely challenging because of the politics. And also, as, as Anne has looked at a lot in her research, um, really challenging given the ethnic conflict and diversity in the country. Yeah, so maybe Anne, you can speak to that more. Yeah, thanks, Tamas. I think another point to remember is that Myanmar is a, a really diverse and a, a really unequal country. So there are over 100 officially recognised ethno-linguistic groups. And since Myanmar was decolonised in 1948, the minority groups were basically largely marginalised from national politics. And this led to the outbreak of conflict from the late 1940s onwards between the sort of central Burma-dominated government forces, the Burma being the majority ethnic group, and then the different ethnic armed groups in the border areas that were basically fighting for freedom and self-determination. And for decades, you had, as Tamas mentioned, this sort of succession of military regimes that also attempted to extend control over these ethnic minority communities and the resource-rich areas in the country's borderlands. And one particular way that the military tried to do this was through what was known as the four cuts policy, which was a strategy to cut flows of food, funds, information and recruits between the ethnic resistance groups and the sort of local communities. And as a result, local communities on the ground were even more impoverished and they were attacked by the sort of central military forces and they lacked access to even basic services, meaning that for decades they became sort of increasingly reliant on international aid. Give us a clearer picture, and then of the geographical restrictions on getting aid right through to those communities, either inside a, a military ruled Myanmar or before the latest coup. How hard is it to actually get to those communities? Yeah, that's a great question. And it really sort of historically impacted the delivery of aid, but also the way aid is provided today. So in the past, during the 1990s and the early 2000s, the military junta really severely restricted the work of aid agencies, particularly international, but also local agencies. And they restricted the delivery of aid basically as part of attempts to weaken resistance and democratic opposition movements. So there are a lot of restrictions on the operations of international aid agencies, particularly in these sort of ethnic areas or the ethnic states, as they're sometimes known. And as a result of this situation, what you had is that by the 1990s, you had the development of sort of two different models or paradigms for the provision of aid. So there was what was commonly called at the time aid via Yangon, which was the former capital city, which was sort of official aid. And then the other model was so-called cross-border aid. So aid via Yangon was the more, quote unquote, traditional model of aid where humanitarian assistance was provided by international aid agencies, whether international NGOs or multilateral agencies like the UN. And these agencies were working legally inside Myanmar with the approval of the military junta. And some of these did what was called direct implementation, so delivering services themselves. Others worked with and through local civil society organizations. And this was sort of the official model of aid. And then you had cross-border aid, which was when assistance was provided through networks that crossed the state border to access people in need of aid. So cross-border aid really developed from the 1990s onwards as a way to support services for communities in those ethnic areas that I was talking about earlier, where the military state really restricted official humanitarian access. And it enabled local organisations to be supported by international funding and to evade these sort of restrictions on access. Tamas, give us just that broad overview of who these NGOs, who these aid agencies actually are, the global ones, the international ones. We'll talk about some of the local agencies a bit further on in our discussion. Who are they and who are their donors? Yeah, Myanmar is a slightly unusual case. So when we think of aid, we think of Oxfam or World Vision, you know, handing out food or a health clinic by Medicines on Frontier or 
that's what comes to mind. But in reality, most of the way that international aid works around the world is government to government aid. So, you know, Australia gives um, money to the Indonesian government, for example, or money from Australia goes to an institution like the World Bank working in countries around the world. But in Myanmar, that whole very significant part of the aid world it has been a very minor part of what's happened in Myanmar because of you know international sanctions against military governments. It's been much more restricted. So mostly in Myanmar, aid has been directed towards United Nations agencies, you know, like UNICEF uh, or UNDP and international NGOs. So I, when I was working in Myanmar, I was working for Save the Children on a on an aid program. So there's there's international NGOs, uh, there's these United Nations agencies who are receiving money from donor countries. And then that money is then used for programming. And there's also, as you as you alluded to there, there's a vast array of Myanmar local aid organizations. A lot of them are supported by international aid, but also other local agencies who are just supported from local donations as well. I guess that's a sense of the array of different actors that are working in, in the aid sector. There are plenty of acronyms in the language of aid, uh, CSOs and CBOs. Let's just clarify them, sharpen the focus. And I'm just trying to imagine the CSOs are the local, the civil society organisations, and the CBOs are those cross-border organisations that uh, you alluded to earlier. How do they dovetail? How do they interact with each other? <laughs> yeah, once we get into these acronyms, it gets a bit confusing. But um, civil society organisation as CSO can refer to international, but often it's used to talk about like a Myanmar locally led organisation. Um, CBO is most often used as a community based organisation. So uh, maybe it's a, a mother's group in a village at that level, a grassroots group that would might be called a CBO, a, a community based organisation. So I'm just now trying to build up a picture in my mind of, because we're talking about the tensions and the difficulties, how do these organisations within the mosaic across Myanmar actually interact with each other? Yeah, well, it's a really interesting tale of uh, if we were to try and trace an international aid dollar coming from Australia, uh, it would generally go to a large international agency. So, for example, a UN agency, which then might give the money to an international NGO like Save the Children. And then that dollar would go on potentially to a local NGO, like a, a Myanmar organisation. And then it may go on from that to a community-based organisation at the village level. It has this sort of hierarchy of flows of funding. Yeah, that's very complex for that dollar to reach the ground. If I can just jump in there as well. Um, so as Tamas was saying, you've got these sort of complex layers through which international funding for aid sort of goes before it can reach communities on the ground. But there's also this very common sort of misrepresentation or misunderstanding of humanitarianism and, and humanitarian response in that, as Tamas sort of alluded to earlier, there's this sort of general picture that when a disaster happens or an emergency happens in a country like Myanmar or anywhere else in the world, those who respond are international agencies. So this is the common sort of misunderstanding or misrepresentation of humanitarian response. In reality, what happens is that those who respond in the first instance are generally those CBOs that we were just talking about, the community-based organisations. So they might be women's groups, they might be religious organisations, they might be any kind of sort of local community network or system. They are the people on the ground who are affected by emergencies and disasters and they are the first responders. So we have this sort of international aid architecture, whereas Tamer said you've got this sort of hierarchy and these different layers through which international funding goes. But in reality, the first responders are those community groups who are often the last people to receive the funding through these layers. Let's take as a case study the cyclone just this year, the Mocha cyclone, which one imagines cyclones and those huge natural disasters as a levelling and a, an equalising force. Everyone's in it together. But I'm also imagining, perhaps wrongly, but I'm imagining that perhaps the underlying tensions and sense of conflict between different ethnic groups and the, perhaps the junta dominate in these situations. So just take us into that case study of the recent cyclone and, and how many people were affected and how it all operated within that emergency situation. 
Yeah, so with Cyclone Mocha, I mean, basically what we had were communities in Rakhine and Chin states that were really, really affected by the cyclone. And these communities had already been affected by conflict and human rights abuses. So these were already very vulnerable and very impoverished communities uh, that were then impacted by the cyclone. And what we had with the Cyclone Mocha response was a sort of illustration of dynamics that have become very, very common in Myanmar, but also other countries across the world. Uh, So as I was sort of talking about earlier, you had this expectation that international agencies would be the ones leading the response. But in reality, international agencies were very restricted by the junta's limitations on international humanitarian access and by the restrictions that it imposed. And local civil society organizations and community-based organizations were the ones that really, really led the response despite the risks involved. So the junta has not only been attacking and targeting international agencies, but also very much local agencies responding to humanitarian crises in the country. And so what we had, for example, was in late May, a very illustrative case was when three local responders, including a very famous Burmese writer and philanthropist by the name of Uwai Hin Ong, who were arrested while providing aid to local communities. And this came as no surprise to civil society members who'd become sort of reaccustomed to really operating in a climate of repression and fear. Despite this repression, despite the risks involved, local community actors have continued to respond to the situation and to provide aid in these areas. So this is the kind of dynamics that we're seeing on the ground. We're seeing these local actors leading the humanitarian response despite amazing sort of risks that they're facing. Tamas, have you been able to observe being on the ground there in Myanmar, cultural differences across different ethnic groupings that might assist or impede the delivery of aid? Yeah, I worked for about seven years in Myanmar and worked in a variety of different programs, including humanitarian programs following another cyclone that was in 2008. I think the most challenging thing is potentially there's cultural differences, but there's also just historical and political and a history of conflict, which makes those things so much more um, challenging and yeah, I mean, we can talk more about the idea of neutrality in contexts like this where there's such long historical tensions that how do you reach these really vulnerable populations? Yeah, the impossibility of, of neutrality in such a complex setting. I think that's a huge aspect of it. And, and the reality is that a lot of over the decades, a lot of the really acute humanitarian crises that have happened have been in those conflict areas which have been in the border areas of the country, which are more likely to be dominated by ethnic minority groups. So that's been the focus of a lot of the humanitarian need, but is also the places of greatest tension between ethnic groups. And perhaps this is a good moment just to give more detail on that ethnic tapestry, because you mentioned the Baymar people, they make up over two-thirds of the population of Myanmar, but there are many others. You've alluded to some of them, but I'm amazed as how many ethnic groupings there are. Could you give us a sense of how many there are and where they are geographically? Yeah, absolutely, Peter. Um, So as we were talking about earlier, Myanmar is, is this sort of very, very complex, very diverse country. There are officially recognised over 100 different ethno-linguistic groups in Myanmar. Some are obviously not recognised, like the Rohingya have never been officially recognised by the Burma-dominated state. Apart from the Rohingya, the Rohingya are obviously very well known and very famous at the international level because of recent events in the past years, but there are many other different ethnic groups that have suffered extensively at the hands of the military over the past decade, so groups including the Karen, the Kachin, the Kareni, the Shan, the Mon, and so on. And these groups have historically been located more in the sort of border areas of the country, what are known as the ethnic states. And these are the areas where the Burma-dominated military state historically imposed not only the four cuts policy, but what's known as a sort of policy of Burmanization to kind of try to control, oppress and homogenize the different ethnic groups. 
And so as Tamas mentioned earlier, these areas were historically affected by conflict, but also a series of disasters provoked by natural hazards and that really sort of exacerbated the suffering, but also the inequalities between different ethnic groups in the country. But one other thing that I just wanted to add that I think is quite notable over the past couple of years since the coup is that a lot of people have been talking about the so-called crisis since the coup as really sort of bringing people together. So we had all these dynamics in the past of division and inequality and exclusion between different ethnic groups. But what we're seeing now is this sort of coming together and and creation of a sense of unity and solidarity as the population throughout the country, all the different ethnic groups, including the Bama population, the majority of these populations are together opposing the military regime and coming together in responding to the humanitarian crisis provoked by the coup. So just as a very concrete example in areas of the southeast where I've worked for many years now with local medics, what we're seeing is all these doctors and nurses who were previously working for the Ministry of Health and Sports in the sort of central government controlled areas. And these people joined democratic protests against the coup and they were then hunted down by the junta and fled to the ethnic controlled areas. And they're now working alongside the medics in these ethnic areas responding to the humanitarian crisis, but also building trust, building solidarity and relationships between community groups that previously saw each other as quite divided and and even sometimes as enemies. So you've got a sort of new dynamic happening at the same time at the moment. Tamus, there's an underlying very obvious question in all this, just listening to what Anne was saying about that ethnic tapestry. What makes the diversity so problematic in the first place? How come the, for example, many other ethnic groupings see each other as a threat? How come the military junta sees various ethnic groupings as enemies within the system? What is the underlying reason for all that? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And it really goes back to some kind of long historical origins of those tensions. And in some ways, the ways that the British colonial government fostered tension and divisions between groups. And the way that the British government, the British colonial forces colonised Myanmar was to separate out the valley area where the Burma majority dominated, and they directly ruled that area. And then in the ethnic areas around the borders of the country, they were left to more kind of autonomous rule under the colonial government. So that was the way that it was set up. So even from the beginning, from the beginning of colonial times, that there was this division set up between the upland groups and then the valley-based majority Burma. And all kinds of processes through the colonial times fostered that. And even the way that they did set up colonial census processes where they wanted to really carefully demarcate different ethnic groups. When we talk about 130 ethnic groups now, a lot of that is set up in the way that the British colonial government wanted to classify people very carefully, whereas previously there may have been a more fluid ethnic identity, the way that the colonial system worked tended to reinforce ethnic differences. So you can imagine with that set up when they were invaded by the Japanese and then got independence that there were incredible tensions around that time about how do you bring together into a single country these different groups that have been ruled differently and have never been under one central government. So right from the beginning, in the very early period after they got independence, there was already civil wars beginning. And then through all the decades of military rule in the 60s, 70s, 80s, those tensions were just inflamed. And then before this most recent coup in Myanmar, how was a divided between those various ethnic groupings and between the geographical regions and what are the principal differences in how aid is actually delivered to those regions and ethnic groups? Yeah, so as we were sort of talking about earlier, in those ethnic states that were impacted by conflict and these sort of four cuts policies for decades, 
there were severe restrictions on international humanitarian access. So it was really in those areas that systems of cross-border aid developed to be able to access local communities. So those cross-border aid systems, they're basically called cross-border aid because you have a, a management and logistics base on the other side of the border, so outside of Myanmar, for instance, in Thailand. And then from that base, there would be sort of uh, supplies that would be channeled to aid workers who lived and worked in ethnic communities on the ground inside Myanmar. And those cross-border aid systems were the systems that historically developed to access communities in those ethnic states. And these differed quite markedly from the sort of more traditional quote-unquote systems that developed in the more central sort of historically at least more stable areas, those Burma-dominated areas where you had more international access, at least compared to the border areas, and therefore you had more possibility of direct implementation by international aid agencies who could actually operate on the ground inside Myanmar. So that's why you had these sort of two different models of aid provision targeting different types of communities in Myanmar, depending on the political and conflict situation. You're listening to Ear to Asia from Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. And just a reminder to listeners about Asia Institute's online publication on Asia and its societies, politics and cultures. It's called the Melbourne Asia Review. It's free to read and it's open access at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. You'll find articles by some of our regular Ear to Asia guests and by many others. Plus, you can catch recent episodes of Ear to Asia at the Melbourne Asia Review website, which again you can find at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. I'm Peter Clark, and I'm joined by Myanmar Watchers Dr. Tamus Wells and Dr. Anne Dacobear. We're discussing the challenges of delivering humanitarian aid in crisis-stricken Myanmar. So, Tamus, after the 2015 national elections in Myanmar... Aung San Suu Kyi's party, the National League for Democracy, the NLD, takes power. How do things change in the delivery and the allocation of aid under that government, with a particular focus on the Rohingya crisis? Initially, there'd been a period, or even before Aung San Suu Kyi's party won that 2015 election, there had been this process of political liberalisation and reform, and a lot of this international sanctions that had been on the country uh, were dropped. That allowed, as I said before, you know, previously Myanmar had actually received really small amounts of international aid. But after those reforms, and especially after the 2015 elections, when Aung San Suu Kyi's party came into power, there was a massive ramping up of international aid to Myanmar. And some people were talking about you know, a gold, aid gold rush where this country had been kind of neglected from the aid system for a long time. And then all of a sudden with those government changes, there was enormous influxes of aid. And along with that came this, there was a, a narrative there about Aung San Suu Kyi being, you know, the saviour of the country and it was very Hollywood with good guys and bad guys and and what we need to do is bring in the aid and investment now that the good guys are in power. So that was the very early period after the NLD took power, but then the Rohingya crisis comes along and the Burmese military responded to some small-scale conflict in Rakhine State in the west of the country with this incredible overreaction where they committed widespread human rights abuses and burnt villages and more than a million Rohingya were forced to cross the border into Bangladesh and most of them still remain there in refugee camps. So there was this extraordinary crisis that happened then and then that forced this change in the narrative around aid and Aung San Suu Kyi was seen very badly during that period for her failure to really condemn the military's violence against the Rohingya people. So there was a, a real confrontation there for many international aid workers who had seen Aung San Suu Kyi and her party as being this sort of progressive future of the country and then all of a sudden they were seen much more negatively and that forced a lot of countries to really pull back. I remember talking to an aid worker as part of my research and 
they said, you know, we thought these people were the good guys, but now we don't know. So there was a huge backpedaling of support for Aung San Suu Kyi's party and for her government at that time. And then how much does that period now carry over into what's happening in the landscape of aid delivery and aid allocation during the military junta period? Yeah, I think there are several ways in which that period has sort of carried over. As Tamas mentioned, there was a lot of faith initially by international donors and international aid agencies in Aung San Suu Kyi's government or the NLD government. And as a result, there was a a sort of massive increase in international aid and specifically development aid. So aid that's more sort of state to state and more focused on long-term development aid instead of, you know, this sort of rapid response emergency type humanitarian aid. So there was a shift at that time. And there was also during this period, particularly towards the beginning of the NLD government, an increased perception of international donors and international aid agencies as being very much sort of aligning themselves with the NLD-led government and with the sort of state building project of this government. And as a result, for ethnic minority communities in the border areas, international aid was often seen as fueling conflict in the border areas. And and this has sort of continued to impact the perceptions of aid in these types of areas. So, you know, I remember traveling around areas of Kayin State, which was also known as Karen State during this time. And And Karen community members would point out these fancy new medical clinics or schools that had been built using international aid, international funding. But these clinics and schools were staffed by Bama government staff, not by local Karen medics or teachers. And local community members saw these clinics and these schools as a way for the Bama dominated state to basically encroach into ethnic areas and weaken the governance systems and services and even the culture of ethnic communities. So you had this sort of growing perception at this time of international aid as sort of bolstering the Bavar dominated state and undermining ethnic groups' aspirations for self-determination. And I think this has sort of continued to fuel a lot of Uh, I guess, sort of negative perceptions of international aid and of the ways in which international aid is not neutral, but rather aligned and sort of taking sides. And take us into one of those villages, one of those communities, just for a few moments. And I'm just intrigued to know about the human to human relationships there. You described the Bama workers within the, say, a health clinic, shiny new health clinic, which was put in by more infrastructure aid. What did you observe in terms of the texture, the character of the human-to-human interactions? Yeah, it's a really good question. And this was really a time of tension in terms of those human-to-human interactions. So what was interesting at that time, particularly in those early years of the NLD government, there was this sort of widespread perception and understanding as Tamas mentioned earlier that Myanmar was really on the path to peace and democracy and, you know, this sort of happy ending. And that was the story or the narrative that international donors or many international donors and many international aid agency representatives really, really believed. But on the ground in communities like this, what you saw was a lot of tension and you saw this in the sort of interpersonal relationships. So, for example, I, I remember doing research at the time on schools, sort of village managed schools in Karen State. And you had a lot of tension emerging between these Bama teachers working for the Ministry of Education and then the local teachers working under the Karen ethnic governance systems, particularly the Karen National Union, and they didn't speak the same language. The Myanmar education system teachers who were coming to those areas didn't know how to work in those communities, and you had a lot of tension and conflict and local villagers not knowing where to send their children and being conflicted between these different systems and approaches. And Can we point to a consistent and coherent set of principles that underlies the aid industry globally and, of course, in Myanmar? 
There are definitely principles that are meant to guide humanitarian action, but I don't think they're really all that coherent or consistent. At least they're not coherently or consistently followed. So what we have today are these sort of contemporary international humanitarian systems and what are known as the so-called humanitarian principles. And these are often seen as a sort of universal benchmark for humanitarianism. But in reality, these so-called humanitarian principles emerged out of a very particular Western context and history, and in particular from the emergence of the Red Cross at the end of the 19th century and the creation of what came to be known as the Geneva Conventions, which provide the foundations for international humanitarian law. And international humanitarian law is, in brief, the sort of framework that ensures humanitarian access, protection, and the right to receive aid. And so you have these principles, as I was saying, uh, and they include the principle of humanity, impartiality, and neutrality. Neutrality in particular has been really, really contested and debated. So while many people argue that neutrality is necessary for good humanitarian action, in reality, there are different approaches and neutrality doesn't always work. So in simple terms, neutrality means not taking sides uh, in a conflict. And you had this idea that humanitarian actors needed to be neutral to maintain access and were then sort of protected and allowed to access combatants and non-combatants. But in reality, in a country like Myanmar, where you have a military that doesn't respect international humanitarian law, that violates humanitarian access, How can you maintain neutrality? Local actors in Myanmar argue that neutrality just doesn't make sense and doesn't work and can instead do more harm than good. Well, what's the other side of that coin then? Because what you're describing historically, I think most of our listeners would think, yes, Red Cross, Red Crescent, powerful symbols, powerful historical symbols of neutrality and humanitarian aid. But if neutrality itself has been distorted, just the very act of providing aid, would demonstrate to those who want to see it that way as an act of enmity. Oh, absolutely. And in Myanmar, the act of providing aid was very much seen as, by the military that is, an act to sort of bolster the resistance to military rule. So aid workers were seen as enemies and there was no respect for the neutrality of aid workers, even if aid workers did try to be neutral. So the other alternative model is what's often known as a solidaristic model of aid provision or sometimes also known as resistance humanitarianism, which is when humanitarianism is politically aligned. And so in Myanmar's border areas, you had this kind of model with the cross-border aid groups that were basically working in partnership with ethnic resistance groups to be able to access communities in need and deliberately took a side. They were, these groups, these cross-border aid organisations were non-neutral in the sense that they combined the provision of aid with advocacy against the military regime, with collecting data about human rights abuses, and with sort of trying to convince international donors and aid agencies to support them in a model of resistance that was deliberately aligned with opposition. Tamus, a sibling principle to neutrality is accountability. And I'm intrigued to know what role donors play in this equation. Yeah, I think there's different elements to that. So if we're thinking about accountability of humanitarian programs, obviously international donors all have their very intricate array of accountability procedures and processes and compliance processes that they have as organisations. I think it's important to remember in all of this, though, that it's not a blank slate. Before international donors arrive, it's not as though there's local communities that they're working in are a blank slate of accountability. I had many experiences of walking into Buddhist monasteries in remote parts of Myanmar and up on the chalkboard in the monastery, they'll have the names of community members and the uh, amount that they donated to the monastery that year or that month. 
in all these communities and within all these local organisations, there's these embedded systems of accountability that are already there. I think that's one of the big issues is the way that international systems assume that there is no accountability until they arrive. Um, And rather than doing that, they could try to build on systems of accountability that are already there. Can we just carve out the China-Myanmar relationship just very briefly because we're talking about international donors of all kinds, many of them coming from existing democracies, but the China-Myanmar relationship is quite different, isn't it? Could you just give us a brief insight into that? Yeah, China has been a, a long supporter of Myanmar, including all of those military regimes that the country's had, and huge economic interests across the country. They're the largest investor in Myanmar. In terms of international humanitarian or development cooperation, the way that China structures those partnerships is just quite different from the way that you know official development assistance, which is more of the Western aid system. Um, so it's a bit hard to compare directly. And China doesn't engage in humanitarian programs in the same way that Western countries have, but there's a huge emphasis on infrastructure. And obviously the Belt and Road Initiative is a bigger framework for China's engagement in the world. Infrastructure has been an enormous point of investment for China in Myanmar. I was working in a program where we were working in remote villages in the north of Myanmar and had access to a four-wheel drive and we were going out to these sort of remote villages along increasingly dishevelled roads that were really difficult to drive on. And at one point we kind of came out of this quite dense jungle area on this incredibly difficult road and went over this little rise and then arrived at a four-lane pristine bitumen highway. And the Chinese government had funded this incredible highway, which ran into this northern remote part of the country where they had mining interests and timber interests and lots of other economic activity. So all over the country, there's things like that happening where they're pouring in huge amounts of money into infrastructure. It is quite contentious, though. There's a lot of local opposition to Chinese investment partly for the way that they have treated local communities as they've been making these new infrastructure projects. There's a lot of discontent about the way that those have been implemented. And let's go back to 2021 now. What was the discernible trigger for the military coup in 2021? And what are the more speculative subtexts for that coup? Yeah, so there's a number of different sort of theories that have been floating around and explanations for the coup. I mean, the the most sort of discernible trigger were the elections at the end of 2020, in which the military-backed party basically lost out a lot, in particular to the National League for Democracy. And so there was this sort of perception at least of a loss of control over government. And I think Tamas can speak to some of those power balance issues. Yeah. At a macro level, there's been this decades-long struggle between military elites and Aung San Suu Kyi and her supporters and then ethnic minority groups. And over the last 10 or 15 years, there was a shift in that, an attempt to try to balance the power between those groups. So on one hand, the military elites allowed some liberalisation and a shift towards civilian government and having elections. On the other hand, the military got a quota of seats in the parliament. They could retain some political control and they were allowed to keep their massive economic interests that they had around the country. And they also had a constitutional clause where they could use the constitution to take back power if they needed to. So there was this balance where there was some degree of civilian government allowed, but the military were allowed to keep their place. But it was a very delicate balance. And then as Anne was saying, the 2020 elections brought a huge victory to Aung San Suu Kyi's party. It's unclear what the exact trigger was, but that balance that had been in place over the previous decade broke down. A lot of our Myanmar colleagues talk about not so much a coup, but a failed coup or an attempted coup in that the military elites haven't been able to control the country. Most of the country is not under their control. So a lot of people would, yeah, as I said, talk about a failed coup. And after the 2021 coup, what was the immediate effect on the aid landscape? The coup has had really, really dramatic impacts on the aid landscape. The first impact is obviously massive, massive increases in need for assistance. Um, This sort of attempted coup or failed coup, as it's often called, has led to 
an escalation in human rights abuses and violence by the military as the military tries to really sort of crush widespread opposition because throughout the country what we've seen is that the local populations have risen against the coup and they've refused to accept a return to military rule. So you've had escalating conflict, escalating violence, and a sort of generalisation of the military strategy of the past, this four cuts policy that we were talking about earlier, which was previously focused on the sort of border areas where you had these ethnic armed resistance organisations. Now you have a sort of generalisation of this approach across the country and therefore escalating suffering and soaring humanitarian needs across the country. Recently, the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs has estimated that almost a third of the population in Myanmar, so more than 17 million people, will actually need humanitarian assistance in 2023. So this is absolutely huge. So you've got escalating humanitarian need. Meanwhile, you've also got escalating restrictions on humanitarian access. So basically, since this attempted coup, the military has resorted to its old playbook, blocking the delivery of aid in many areas, destroying food and medical supplies, diverting aid from its intended recipients, and attacking and even killing aid workers. So you've got this sort of dual dynamic, escalating need and increasing restrictions on humanitarian access. So many international NGOs left Myanmar, I guess triggered largely by the safety of their workers from what you just described. So who stepped up? What were the organisations that actually stepped up and how have they reorganised themselves? Basically, so in this situation, it's the local agency, the local organisations and the community members on the ground who've stepped up and they've been the ones leading the humanitarian response despite facing major risks to the lives and the safety of local aid workers. So in this really, really sort of restrictive and repressive political environment, local organisations and agencies are the ones that basically have the knowledge and the networks to be able to navigate that political environment and sort of evade the military's restrictions. And as a result, what we have is not only international agencies withdrawing from the country, but many international agencies have actually shifted their ways of operating. So agencies that relied on direct implementation, so international agencies implementing aid themselves directly, many of those agencies have now shifted to working with and through local civil society organisations and community-based organisations. And again, they're the ones leading the delivery of aid on the ground. Could you give us a, a clear example of just how those shifts have taken place? What would be different in the current circumstances with that change in the model? Well, in simple terms, particularly, you know, for instance, if you take the central areas of Myanmar, what's commonly known as the dry zone, in these areas, they were sort of historically much more stable and there was more access by international agencies historically um, compared to the border areas. And so you often had international NGOs, for example, implementing aid directly. So what this meant in practical terms was that, and I've worked with agencies like this, you'd have an international NGO that would send its own staff to give food supplies or, you know, build latrines in villages or do health education, that kind of thing. Now those agencies can't access the communities on the ground themselves. So what they've done is that they've shifted to working with and through partner organisations on the ground or sort of civil society organisations, maybe a women's group, a religious group, a youth group on the ground. They're often very amorphous. They're not very official, often unregistered. And those are the networks that are basically delivering services and delivering goods to communities on the ground. So that's how it's working. It seems to me that establishment of clear priorities for what specific aid is needed in a certain community lies at the heart of a lot of this, with the international NGOs perhaps having their view of priorities and the locals having perhaps a different view of the priorities, what their real and immediate need might be. How does that play out? 
that's an age-old question in the development and humanitarian sectors around the world is how do you develop, yeah, as you say, the priorities for what aid money should be spent on. And there's been a lot of efforts by international agencies to to have participatory processes where they find out from communities what the highest needs are and all those kinds of things. What a lot of local Myanmar organisation leaders talk about is while the intentions are good from international agencies to have that participation and locally led, everyone loves the idea of locally led aid. So no one's against that. But these Myanmar leaders would say that the way that international agencies work in a relatively hierarchical way means that in practice, they can't be as participatory as they would like to. And they would say that Myanmar organisations, because of their cultural understanding, can operate in a more grassroots priorities focused way uh, there's also questions about whether large local organizations can do that well as well um, but that would be the critique from local organization leaders yeah if i might jump in there as well community leaders and, and civil society leaders on the ground it's not just a question of determining the priorities or what type of aid is provided it's also about how aid is provided and what requirements come with international funding to support that aid. So there's a lot of criticism at the moment on the ground by civil society actors who complain about, for example, international donors requiring them to, you know, implement these really, really rigid approaches to risk management, compliance and reporting that create additional burdens and dangers for local actors. So, for example, we speak with civil society actors on the ground and they tell us that, you know, they're often required to get multiple quotes before they can purchase aid supplies. So that's a requirement that comes with those sort of compliance obligations for donors and and that accountability that you were talking about earlier. But it makes it very, very difficult for local actors, you know, in an emergency situation. It's difficult for local aid workers to get three quotes to be able to buy rice for local villages. It takes time. It's also potentially dangerous because if they carry around documentation like written quotes for rice or like lists of villages to whom they've distributed that rice, Those aid workers can be at risk if they're intercepted by a military that sees the provision of aid as automatically an attempt to bolster resistance. So these are also the types of criticisms that we're seeing on the ground. We framed this discussion with the idea, the notion of radical and significant reform and those critiques that you've just alluded to. What would be the very character and nature of that reform, taking on board some of the things you've described, and would that reform be achievable? So the types of reforms that civil society actors and organisations in in Myanmar are calling for at the moment are linked with what's commonly called the the so-called localisation or decolonisation of aid, which in simple layman's terms is about really shifting the imbalance of power so that aid is more locally led and doesn't reproduce those types of inequalities that we've mentioned and those sort of injustices for aid workers on the ground. So civil society leaders and organisations in Myanmar are right now demanding that international donors and aid organisations basically put more direct funding and decision-making power into the hands of local and national responders and that they also adopt more flexible and adaptive approaches to funding, compliance and reporting, approaches that would be sort of more adapted to the local context and needs of local communities. Give us some examples of that, because I hear those fine words, but I guess the idea we touched on accountability earlier, the concerns with governance at a local level, the always present idea, and at least in people's minds, of corruption and diversion of funding, etc. So how are all those conflicts resolved? So one, you know, very concrete example is, you know, going back to that idea of providing three quotes for a bag of rice, civil society actors are asking the international donors and aid agencies basically 
loosen or roll back some of those requirements. And to give them their due, some international donor agencies and aid agencies in Myanmar have done exactly that. So, for example, they're not now requiring three quotes for rice or other aid supplies. They're not requiring that local agencies provide, you know, lists of beneficiaries that might put those beneficiaries at risk. And that in turn actually requires that those international donors and aid agencies trust those local actors much more, trust those local mechanisms for accountability that Tamus was talking about earlier. I was going to just build on that and say that that one of the shifts that we've looked at with part of our research is, is really about the directness of relationships that local groups can have with international donors. So rather than having, as I said before, about that hierarchy and that flow that aid goes through all these different agencies from the, you know, Australia as the, for example, the international donor, and then through all these layers to the local community, there's been a group of larger Myanmar NGOs who have been pushing to have a more direct role where they interact directly with, for example, Australian aid agencies. So rather than having all these intermediaries, international intermediaries in between, that they can go directly. And and in some ways that cuts against the the sort of structures that you know the aid hierarchy brings more and more compliance requirements that may not be appropriate to the context. So if these big MAMA NGOs can renegotiate the power relations and have more direct relationships with international donors, that can really reshape the decision-making power within those systems. I'm thinking perhaps the subtitle for this episode should be Get Three Quotes. It seems to, <laughs> it seems to sum it up in many ways. As we come to the end of our conversation, can both of you describe what you've been able to see or hear about very positive developments on the ground as various local aid agencies and the actors within them actually somehow, despite the dire situations, despite the risks and despite the various ethnic conflicts, actually do deliver aid right down to the to the grassroots? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a way to look at the silver lining here. And when we speak with local aid workers and, and civil society actors on the ground in Myanmar, they often describe the current situation in Myanmar as not only one of suffering and one of, you know, major disappointment in terms of what's happened, you know, the tragic events that have happened since this coup, or since this attempted coup, but they also describe it as a time of opportunity, a time of opportunity for local actors on the ground to not only lead the provision of aid, but also show that it's really, really important for aid programs to be, you know, shaped by local needs, local systems and local approaches. So it's not just about local actors delivering aid, it's local actors shaping the way that aid should be delivered. Yeah, and just recently we we were speaking with a, a range of leaders of these local organisations and this is after Cyclone Mocha and they were talking about their efforts to be really early responders after the cyclone. And I think Things have changed. Like if I think back to my experiences and, you know, 10 or even 15 years ago and the way that the aid system worked at that time, there wouldn't have been the space within international aid systems for local groups to be able to do that kind of work, to immediately respond after a cyclone and get aid delivered right down to the community level. I think that in some ways there's a growing sense of respect and acknowledgement of the ability of those organisations to work in really challenging contexts in in fantastic ways. So I think that's changing. Anne and Tamas, could we finish our conversation by putting on the the wide-angle lens again, going big picture again? You've described various really problematic situations within Myanmar, but looking at places like Ukraine, Afghanistan, Sudan, many others, analogues, if you like, of what's happening in Myanmar with similar or albeit varying types of conflicts and difficulties – What can we learn from Myanmar that might be applied more generally to the aid landscape around the world? I think one important lesson that Myanmar really, really drives home is the importance for humanitarian programs and approaches to be developed 
to suit the specific context in which they're implemented. So we were talking at the beginning of this discussion about, you know, these so-called humanitarian principles that are seen as still, you know, a sort of universal model of humanitarianism or a sort of litmus test of humanitarianism, as one international donor once described them to me. But you know, while there might be similarities between, for example, Myanmar and Sudan, or Myanmar and Afghanistan or the Ukraine in terms of things like restrictions on humanitarian access, the politicization of aid and so on, in reality, there can and should be no one size fits all approach. Tamers. I think the Myanmar story tells us that the world's changing. The aid sector has in some ways been a hangover from the colonial era in, in the way it's managed and centralised decision making. And I, and I say that not in a kind of accusatory way. I feel like I've worked in the aid sector and I feel like I've been part of that system. It's more just an acknowledgement of, of the way that decision making power works. And there's definitely colonial elements of that that remain. But I think around the world and what we're seeing in Myanmar is there's this push against that and the old ways of big international agencies kind of running their own show and making their own decisions. That's going to come to an end. And I think we're seeing in different contexts, we're seeing that happening. And local actors need to have just a much stronger say in the shape of programs and the way that things are designed. So, yeah, I think the question for international donors and you know international organisations now is how they're going to step into the new era. There, there will be some who will be really willing to move towards a less colonial, more empowering model. And there's going to be others who are going to be moving, kicking and screaming into a new era. So I think it's really interesting times. And thankfully, there are some international agencies who are trying to move there already. A vital discussion as we look at Myanmar from afar here in Australia with concern and pain often. So thank you, Tamas, and thank you, Anne, for being with us again on Ear to Asia. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Our guests were Dr Anne Dacobert and Dr Tamas Wells from the University of Melbourne. Ear to Asia is brought to you by Asia Institute of the University of Melbourne. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at the Asia Institute website. Be sure to keep up with every episode of Ear to Asia by following us on the Apple Podcasts app, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please rate and review us. It helps new listeners find the show. And put in a good word for us in your socials. This episode was recorded on the 5th of July, 2023. Producers were Kelvin Parham and Eric Van Bemmel of Profactual.com. Ear to Asia is licensed under Creative Commons, copyright 2023, the University of Melbourne. I'm Peter Clark. Thanks for your company.